Well, let's play with a little something here. The devices that we deal with, the, remember I told you S2020 was written around a 100 volt device. It was first written in 1999 around a 100 volt device. We get calls every day now for, now they want to worry about class zero, not the zero of zero to 249, but what happens if I get a device that's less than 100 volts? The devices are continuing to get more and more sensitive. So, 100 volts. We were talking about some huge charges there earlier. For you to feel a discharge, minimum of two to 3,000 volts, that's for you to just feel it. For you to see that, that spark, it's about 7,500 volts. Rule of thumb for you, this and a quarter will get you a lousy cup of coffee. It's about 20,000 volts per inch of air gap, okay? So if you watch up to a doorknob and you're about an inch away with your finger before that thing turns around and makes that jump, you had about 20,000 volts on. Now, the way to impress little children and men who aren't too bright, you go down to a science museum, you've seen the things where you got the two rods that come up and they're putting voltage across it, and then finally it stops. If you can estimate that distance between the rods at the point where that charge broke down, that's how much voltage was being, was being used to turn around and, and generate that. So if you get four inches apart, you know, you're talking about 80,000 volts was there. Now, we're talking volts here, we're not talking about amperage, so nobody ever got fried by going and touching a doorknob, because there's, there's no amperage that's behind it. So 2,000 volts before you can feel it. That means that you guys can be passing amongst yourselves and the devices, if you're not handling them properly, voltages that you'll never feel, never see, never know, that can cause absolute catastrophic damage to the devices that you're handling. Voila, ESD control. Less than 100 volts can, can uh, damage a component. Why so sensitive? One of the reasons that devices are sensitive and they're getting more sensitive, you know how we always talk about you know, devices doubling in speed? They never go up by like 5% or 10%, they double. You can only make electrons move so fast. So if I've got, if I'm gonna move electrons from here to here and I wanna do it twice as fast, how do I do it? I move this guy half the distance. Only have to send the electrons half as far. And I move it a little bit closer. I just doubled the speed of the device. And I move it a little bit closer. Well, we're constantly making the devices smaller, putting more stuff onto the device, moving everything a little bit closer together. And as we do that, those devices become more and more sensitive because they're more and more low voltage devices. I mean, ESD was not a big problem when you had these big vacuum tubes. Now we got these little components. Rule of thumb, smaller the component, the more sensitive it is. Just a generalization. Um, devices also used to have onboard technology built on them. I remember when I first got involved in this stuff in 79, um, was talking with engineers up in Silicon Valley and they're saying, you know, we're gonna build onboard protection. This ESD thing's not gonna be a problem. I'm thinking, you know, should I get out of this? It's not really a good thing if you guys are gonna engineer out what it is that I do. Uh, well, they haven't been able to totally eliminate it. They kept on making the devices more sensitive than what they were able to control, and now the manufacturers of devices are taking onboard control off because in users, they want the device to operate faster. Well, the onboard slows it down. They also want to get more stuff in the device. Somewhere around 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the real estate on this device is sucked up by onboard protection. Well, I want the devices smaller. So making them do more, making them do it faster in a smaller space, they're taking the onboard protection off. Chip device manufacturer people, from their standpoint, they're saying it doesn't really matter because good ESD control in the factory will trump what's on the device, so what's on the device is not necessary. So they're taking it away. Your company's in good shape. I got companies we deal with, they can't even spell ESD two out of three times correctly, let alone have an ESD control program. Um, at some point, it'll, it'll probably back up to suppliers of yours as, as, as your program turns around and matures, but ESD control is not an event, it's a process. It's a process of quality, of continual improvement. I think your company is probably better today than it was 10 years ago, okay, and you should be better five years from now than you are today. You're not going to get five years better overnight. It's a process. It grows. Here's another picture of a device. Notice where the arrow is, because we're going to expand this little sucker. 
And now see where that little arrow is pointing down there? Okay, the little fuzz down at the bottom. And what that fuzz is? It's a little hole that was blown into the device. Too many electrons went across that device and it melted the very thin metal substrate. When that happens, you can get catastrophic damage, you can get latent damage. And we'll talk about that. Catastrophic. Catastrophic is good. You build it, you test it, it doesn't work. Well, that's not as good as you build it and you test it and it works. Okay? But you build it, you test it, it doesn't pass test. Okay? It's, that device is catastrophically destroyed. That's less expensive because it's in-house. You can go, you can troubleshoot it. I was talking with a company. <laughs> they had a production area of like 15 benches and they had a rework area of like 25 benches. They said, we don't have a problem. How come rework is bigger than production? Well, it takes longer to fix it than it does to make it. I think rework should be smaller than production. Catastrophic, you build it, you test it, it's dead. It doesn't work. That's easy. That's easy when you find out about it. Big one, what we call latent defects. Okay? That is, you damage a device. Okay? Not enough to kill it, but it passes all your in-house tests. But the device is weakened. Okay? Now, somewhere out in the field, 60, 90, 120 days, the device, because it's been weakened, now it dies. <coughs> That's bad. It's bad for a number of reasons. But consider this one for a moment. When we're talking about an electronic device, we're not talking about a motor. We're not talking about moving parts. We're not talking about wearing stuff out. We're talking about moving electrons through little conductive materials and things happening because electrons are moving. Things don't wear out, which is why if you build it right, you can build a part, you can put it inside a thing, you can put it in a capsule, you can ship the dude off, and 15 years later you can be getting data from that capsule as it's going around Mars and going off here and going off there, and it's 15, 20, 30 years, eventually it gets out of range, we can't get anything from it. But it doesn't, there's nothing to wear out. It's not like a motor that's wearing out. So if we've got electronic parts that are not working after some little time period, and normally it's that burn-in time period, that 16, 90, 120 day time period when it's turned on and turned off and turned on, that stresses a device. And if it's weak, that's typically where it dies is in that, is in that, that little time frame right there. So we've got this walking wounded. It's been damaged. Nobody knows it. It goes out and it costs a lot more money to repair. Now, this came, uh, well, what happens is it, it, it passes through everything and stuff, and when it hits the customer, that latent defect, it gets out in the field, hits the customer. Now you've got not only your time to find the problem, but now the customer has found it, they're upset, something else is down, something needs to be replaced, it needs to come back. The cost tends to go up. Study that was done a number of years ago, and it went something like this. If I take all of my parts, they cost me $10, and if I do a 100% inspection, which I can't afford to do, and I find a bad part, I'm out 10 bucks. I put a part in a board, and the board doesn't pass final inspection. It's not a $10 component. It's a $100 component. To take it out, find what's wrong, fix it, put it back in for final test, put it back into the system. I put the board into a system, and the system doesn't work, it's not a $10 component, it's not a $100, it's a $1,000 component. Because the system's got to come offline, you've got to find the board, you've got to pull the board out, you've got to repair the board, you've got to put a new board back into the system. System's got to go back through all of its previous testing and everything before it can be shipped. And you ship it out to the customer, field service has to be called in, okay, and it can be a $10,000 component. This company was not involved in the industry that you're involved in. You guys deal with avionics. We're not talking about a computer system that doesn't work and so, you know, some CEO can't get his financial data for 12 or 14 hours. We're talking planes. Your stuff doesn't work. So we're talking really high reliability on your end. 